In May of this year, a new denomination was launched called the Global Methodist Church, which formed in part to oppose the possibility for the allowance of same-sex marriages and ordination of homosexual persons. Since the launch, many of our United Methodist pastors and leaders have been sent information by the organizers of the Global Methodist Church about leaving the United Methodist Church and recruiting us to join the Global Methodist Church. I've received emails, letters, and invitations to informational gatherings about leaving the United Methodist Church and joining the Global Methodist Church. Maybe you've received some of the same, or been forward recruitment videos and articles and so forth. I plan to remain an ordained pastor in the United Methodist Church. Now, some of the things that I've been asked since making that announcement, do you not just believe in, do you, do you uh, believe in scripture or not? The Bible is clear on homosexuality as sin. Are you just going to ignore that? Uh, I've also been, uh, people have said to me, you cannot change the Bible to fit society. Well, let me say, I have an extremely high view of Scripture. In fact, I believe that we have a sacred duty to not only read the Bible, but to do our best to understand, to discern sacred Scripture. My journey on this issue has everything to do with holding a high view of Scripture. In fact, it's ultimately because of my regard for the authority of Scripture that I found it hard to hold on to my former belief that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. I'd like to share my journey with you. See, back in 2019, as the United Methodist Church held a special call general conference to discuss human sexuality, I found myself firmly in the camp that affirmed homosexual people as persons of sacred worth, but at the same time, I affirmed that the practice of homosexuality was incompatible with Christian teaching. As the debate continued and church members asked me about my opinion, sometimes to make sure that I was traditional and sometimes to press me to be more progressive, I realized that I needed a firmer foundation scripturally for what I believed. I needed to be able to articulate my position, especially to those that leaned more progressive than I did. So I set about to, to arm myself with Bible verses that would clearly support my traditional beliefs. I wanted to ground my stance in Scripture. That's where the trouble began. The more I dug into Scripture, the more I questioned whether my traditional beliefs were indeed scriptural. Suddenly, the Bible was not as clear on homosexuality as I once thought it was. Now, you know, there are certain passages of Scripture that are typically used to condemn homosexuality. Specifically, there are six passages that are most often cited to condemn homosexual activity. We're going to take them one by one. But first, when I read these passages with the intention to understand the homosexual angle within the verses, the first thing that made me a bit uncomfortable was the surrounding language in most of these passages. None of them seem to be in the context of condemning same-sex committed relationships. Like most people, I have friends and family that are gay, and something in me made me really reflect as to whether or not the lesbian couple I know who have been together for over 30 years were in the same category as adulterers, murderers, prostitutes, and thieves. As we go into scripture, um, and look at that. I want to give a little context. See, there was some pretty terrible stuff going on back then. There was an epidemic of sex with boys. They castrated boys, in fact, in an effort to slow puberty because prepubescent boys were preferable as sex partners. There was a rape culture among the powerful in which rape was a way to emasculate and conquer men into submission. Contextually, there was some pretty deviant stuff going on and it had much more to do with asserting power over others and gratifying lust, not long-term relationships. That being said, we still have to deal with what the Bible actually says. I can pull out the Bible I read from each Sunday and, and right there in big bold print, it says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. And it says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, and so on. We still have to deal with that. So let's get to it. Let's deal with those six passages I told you about. The first one is Genesis 19, 1 through 11. It's a long one. It's one you'll probably, probably recognize, even if you haven't read it before, you're probably aware of it. It's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, making bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do with them what you like. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play judge? We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out, pulled Lot back into the house, and shut the door. When they struck, then they uh, struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. This is a terrible story. What's it meant to convey? Certainly not that gang raping two girls is morally superior to raping two men. It's obvious that the men of Sodom were morally depraved. These men of the town are seeking to gang rape a newcomer to the area. There doesn't seem to be any implication that anyone is seeking a same-sex relationship. There is, however, an abhorrent show of dominance, lust, and aggression. I simply fail to understand to see how this story condemns two people of the same sex committing themselves to one another in mutual support. Now, two of the verses that people often quote to condemn homosexuality uh, beyond uh, Sodom and Gomorrah come from Leviticus. The first one, uh, chapter 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. Hebrew is not quite as succinct and specific as modern English. A closer word-for-word -word translation would be, with male offspring, do not bed woman, abomination he is. So let's get past the wonkiness of the wording and concentrate on the Hebrew word for male. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. The Hebrew word that's used here is zakar. You shall not lie with a zakar as with a woman. Zakar means male. Often it means male offspring. The word for mankind is adam. The word most, most often used for an adult man is ish. So we have three Hebrew words that could have been used here. Adam, humankind, ish, adult man, and zakar, male offspring. The writer of Leviticus used zakar. It's the same word used in Leviticus 12.2. If a woman conceives and bears a male child, zakar, she shall be unclean for seven days. And in 12.7, this is the law made for her who bears a child, male or female. Again, the word is zakar. It's also found in Isaiah 66.7. Before her pain came upon her, she delivered a son, zakar. We find it again in the uh, other Leviticus verse that's used to condemn homosexuality. Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Interestingly, in this sentence, we find both the Hebrew word for adult man, ish, and the Hebrew word for male, offspring, um, zakar, the New Revised uh, Standard Version uses male as the translation, but you know, once again, putting it in context, if a man, Ish, lies with a male, Zakar, as with a woman, if Ish lies with Zakar, if we want to make an even more clearer, more specific translation, it could read, if a man lies with a male offspring. 
Okay, even if we accept that this translation is clearly talking about an adult man lying with an another with another adult male, which I, I think is somewhat difficult for us to prove, but even if we accept that it says, if a man lies with a man as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall be put to death, their blood is upon them. Then why are we not putting gay men to death? Are we picking and choosing which part of the scripture to follow? What about Leviticus 20, verse 9? All who curse father and mother shall be put to death. All I'm saying is that these verses that many consider to be very clear about homosexuality may not be quite as clear as you think. And if they are that clear, isn't the punishment clear as well? Well, wait, that's the Old Testament stuff. These passages in the New Testament, they're clear. Well, let's look at those passages in the New Testament. We'll start in 1 Corinthians. You know what? We're going to go ahead and do 1 Corinthians, and we'll also look at um, 1 Timothy while we're at it. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, uh, and this comes from the uh, New American Standard translation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 uh, says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. It's pretty clear. Neither effeminate nor homosexuals. Did you know that the word homosexual didn't appear in any translation of the Bible until the 1940s? So what were the words that were used here that eventually became translated as effeminate and homosexual? The first word, the one for effeminate, was malakos in Greek. It literally meant soft. A cushion could be called malakos. In this case, malakos is likely referring to the passive partner. In fact, it's probably referring to a male prostitute that's made himself soft or effeminate for the purposes of prostitution. The New Revised Standard Version actually does translate it as male prostitute. The other word, arsenokotai, is the uh, word translated as homosexual in uh, many modern translations. And Luther translated it as kanabeshander, which means boy molester. Many scholars think that the word Paul uses here, this arsenokotai in Greek, is a word that Paul created. Most believe that it's tied directly to the Old Testament verbiage um, from Leviticus, one that we've already established could very well mean male offspring. And for Luther to translate it as boy molester, well, that certainly leaves room for us to question its true meaning. Arsenokotai is also the word that's used in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 9-11. through 11. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. The word used in the New Revised Standard Version here, uh, translated from arsenokotai, is sodomite. You can find the word homosexual in other translations, translations such as the uh, NIV and the NASB. Again, Luther translated it as kanabeshander, in the and in the 1940s, uh, the switch was made to homosexual in most of those uh, many of these translations. Now. Let's deal with the argument of, wait, that's just parsing of words, and who cares what Luther said? Well, remember what we've already established about rape culture at that time, and the deplorable uh, epidemic of men having sex with boys, parents offering their sons to men of power. These things are easy to verify. A quick study of Greco-Roman history certainly supports these horrific yet common practices. And it seems reasonable to me that Scripture is much more interested in condemning sex with boys and prostitutes rather than condemning consenting adult same-sex relationships. Now, we've got one more instance in Scripture to talk about, and it doesn't use the words malakos or arsenokotai. The passages in question come from Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. 
For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Paul is writing about pagan idolatry here in Romans. In verse 23, Paul is talking about them portraying their gods as animals. He says they worship the creature in verse 25. The Egyptians were known to portray their gods as animals. The Isis cult was on the rise in Rome when Paul wrote this letter. See, previously Caesar Augustus and Tiberius expelled the worship of Egyptian gods on the basis of immorality and opposition to social order. Then Caligula came into power and gave this Isis cult protected status and Isis worship began to rebound. Part of Isis worship was rooted in sex. I won't go into all the practices, but I want to mention something here that's very relevant to this passage. The Isis cult had both priests and priestesses. There were times in which um, Isis priests and priestesses were to be celibate. They were not permitted to have intercourse, and they considered intercourse to be with someone of the opposite sex. Even the Greek words that are used here uh, don't specifically mean sex. The word translated as intercourse technically means function or use of. Making babies is the natural function. So what generally happened was that during these Isis cult times of celibacy, or when they were not permitted to have heterosexual intercourse, the priests and priestesses satisfied their sexual desires with members of the same sex. They gave up natural intercourse for unnatural. I believe Paul is warning against falling into the Isis cult that was growing at the time, not condemning same-sex relationships. Does any of this prove that the Bible affirms same-sex relationships? Not really. But I am convinced that none of this is proof that the Bible condemns same-sex relationships. In Methodism, we lean heavily on scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. I think we've shown that scripture doesn't offer a strong reason to condemn homosexuality. Tradition? Well, there's certainly a tradition in the church that does not affirm homosexuality. Uh, at least there's much tradition that points that direction over the last century, though I'm not really sure that the early church was all that concerned about it. Reason? Well, it's reasonable to consider uh, that the main purpose for sex, for sex is to produce children. Uh, it may not be the only purpose, but it is a primary person uh, purpose. Uh, but considering the world that we live in, it also seems reasonable that a same-sex couple could be a viable alternative as parents to children that don't have biological parents to care for them. And finally, experience. What does your experience with homosexual individuals tell you? My observation of homosexuals is similar to my observation of heterosexuals. So far, I've not found any of my homosexual acquaintances and or friends to be any more deviant than anyone else. Nor have I found my heterosexual friends or acquaintances to be any more Christ-like than those who have same-sex attraction. So, can someone with a high view of scripture, one that places scriptural authority at the highest level, remain in a United Methodist Church that could someday remove restrictive language from the Book of Discipline to be more inclusive? The answer is yes. In fact, I believe that we have shown that someone with a high view of scripture would actually find it hard to condemn same-sex relationships. That's why I will remain in the United Methodist Church, and I hope you will too. God bless you.